Master Jay. Awesome. Hey, we're gonna we're gonna close with what we talked about. Um, thank you, brother. I got your text. You're awesome. It's great. Um, so uh, let's get started here. Give this Pastor Jay a, a hand. He may already have one, but you give him one. I got no, but give him, give him. We have extras. We're good. All right, well, guys. What we do is we read the Bible out loud together. Okay. Um, and Rock and Ronnie. All right. Congratulations, man. Goodness gracious. What do you give someone that's celebrating? Rock and Ronnie? Well, you see here. Yeah, we take care of our people here. All right, now we're going to get started here, okay? We'll read this together out loud, Psalm 103, 22 verses. Everybody, this is our part to, to, with our voices to the Lord, of course, but to say the Scripture together. Starting in verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made way known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourishes. For the wind passes over it, <clears throat> and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear Him, and His righteousness to children's children, to such as keep His covenant, and to those who remember His commandments to do them. The Lord has established His throne in heaven, and His kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, you his angels, who excel in strength, who do his word, heeding the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all you his host, you ministers of his, who do his pleasure. Bless the Lord, all his works, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. This is God's word. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God endures forever so question number one i got more handouts if you need them we just take these questions which take us through the text which is the the object of this whole our whole time together because it's god's word that is so powerful and not man's word there you go brother yes sir help yourself so i got plenty of these left so i put this question here what does it mean to bless the lord now it's real interesting Remember 9-11 and how oh, it was, which was cool that our whole country started, like people that denied prayer and did nothing, anything to do with God started talking about God and started turning to God. And you heard this expression that's been around a long time, God bless America. Everyone say that. God bless America. So this evangelist, fired up believer, got real controversial. And I interviewed him on my show. He sent me a bumper sticker that said, America, bless God. Everyone say that with me. America, bless God. And he said, for decades, we've been asking God to bless our country. 
Here we've kicked them out of our schools. Here we've, 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 we've violated and, and desecrated what he calls marriage between a man and a woman. Here we've, we've, we've slandered his name. And he says, instead of saying, God bless America, maybe we should say, America bless God. And maybe we should like turn to him and praise him and bless him. And Psalm 103, now it was real controversial. And it's hard to, it was hard to just, I think I lost that argument. You know, <laughs> you know I was holding on to my old, the, the God bless America. And I think, he, you know, his point was well taken. <clears throat> but regardless of that controversy, this psalm is a psalm of us blessing God. Of David, King David. This psalm has inspired more Christian songs and hymns than any other of the psalms, except for Psalm 23. Did you know that? This psalm has more accolades, and um, I love what Dr. John Phillips says. He says this. He says, this is David's hallelujah chorus. It's a psalm of singular beauty with a rhythmic quality all of its own. It contains 22 verses each of them the same number of verses as there are in the Hebrew alphabet. It's like a tetranogram. It's a Hebrew thing. Really cool. <clears throat> you got to understand what's going on in the culture of the Bible. It really makes it rich. <clears throat> he says, the covenant title Lord Jehovah occurs half that number of times, <clears throat> like 11 times. It's what we call an envelope psalm. It opens the same way it closes. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And he says, I love this. He says, Anytime we have trouble praising the Lord, we should turn to this psalm, get down before the Lord, and recite it back to Him. It is a pion of perfect praise. Psalm 103. So this is <clears throat> rich, <clears throat> excuse me, and you have it opening with bless the Lord. So what does it mean to bless the Lord? Back to that question. And anybody and everybody, something comes to mind? There's a mic here, so our friends, a lot of folks watch us on the Facebook and on the video that can't be here. Uh, you know, my mom and pa, or a couple of them, and others that, you know, we got guys embedded battling overseas for us that can't be here that have a Wi Fi. Uh, so the word bless, excuse me, Barak is the Hebrew word, and it means to praise, it means to salute, it means to extol, to exalt, to celebrate to make much of, to bless the Lord. A lot of your versions have the word praise. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Has the same intent, has the same meaning, has the same impact. So David starts off this psalm with those words. Now, in Hebrew poetry, a lot of times the, the author will, you see it all over the place, will repeat something to make it fit. So there'll be what we call parallelisms. He says the same thing a different way. So he says, bless the Lord, O oh my soul. By the way, all my life I've been saying that, and I just figured out why. Because mama's been quoting this passage since I was a wee lad. So a lot of times I'll say, O oh my soul, and I'll say it if I see something really good, like little cubs brownies or something like that. I'll say, O oh my soul. Wow. It's just become part of my, and I just figured out this week, I just figured out why I, why I say that expression. It just came to me. So, But what is that? The, the Hebrew word for soul is nephesh. It is your innermost being. It is your very person, your personhood, your identity. It is the, the part of you that is you, your soul. And he says, oh, my soul. Now, cognitive therapy, we talked about this a little bit. You see all throughout the Psalms, we saw it in Psalm chapter 42, where David is talking to himself. And he says, why are you downcast, O oh my soul? And what cognitive therapy is, it was invented long before Freud or psychologists came on the scene. It is having a conversation with yourself. And I know some of you guys talk to yourself a lot, and you probably don't have much to say, and, and you, you might ignore yourself. But, you know, but the psychologist will tell you, you know, in, when you're... When yourself says, hey, man, I got to get a hit on that, you know, whatever I'm addicted to. The psychologist say, tell yourself to shut up, right? <laughs> tell yourself, no, sit back down. No, don't pick up that phone. And so, but on a deeper level, biblically, David is talking to himself, and he's proclaiming the goodness of God to himself. 
So if you're going to talk to yourself, okay, you're going to say, bless the Lord, oh my soul. He's telling his soul. He's grabbing himself at the innermost heart. Everyone say, good morning, Dr. Carson. Good morning, Dr. Carson. Love this man of God. Awesome. Gives a verse of the day for every day of the year. It's amazing. Date the word. Yep. Colleen is here. Good morning, Colleen. All right, brother. Awesome. All right, special. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Go down. Get that to Dr. Carson, please. Yes, sir. Right there. So, um, so I just put this question here. What does it mean to, you know, this is rampant throughout the Psalms. Blessing the Lord, praising the Lord, exalting the Lord. It's all over the place. Why is it so powerful? Why is the praise of God so important, so perennial, so powerful, so central? Go. Conversation with ourselves when we say, bless the Lord or my soul. Mm. Bless the Lord means that there is a power, there is an authority, there is a dignitary that we're asking to do something, and we're recognizing that it is him who lives within us. So mm. if we're asking the one who can do it to do it for us, we're in all ways acknowledging his wisdom his mm. glory and his providence. Good, so good. Wow. Go ahead, Ralph. Yeah, on that line. Grab the mic. We can hear you better. Mm -hmm. well, what most of the world does, and what we've done as a nation, is that we uh, we turn his blessings into idols. Yes. And so uh, it's our it's our chance to recognize that these idols come from that we need to bless him and not focus on the idols Love that, that he's given yeah, us. Yeah, very good. So God focused, God centered. So he says, bless the Lord, O my soul. Then he takes this little statement. And all that is within me. Everyone say all. All. You have the word all, by the way, all over the place. No pun intended. Wow, see, I even threw it in there. It was unintentional. You have all that is within me. Forget not all his benefits. You have this, this idea. He forgives all your iniquities. He heals all your diseases. So you're blessing an infinite God who is everything. He owns all. He can do all. And he's pouring out that infinite grace and love onto us. So this idea of all is there. But all that is within me. David says, look, I'm blessing the Lord. I'm summoning every ounce of my capacity as a human being. Every iota, every pinch, every, every bit of energy in my soul to bless the Lord, all that is within me. Everyone say, all that is within me. All that is within me. So here's a question. If we go into church, how many of us, how much energy are we putting into worshiping God? Now, I'm gonna get, it's going to get real convicting for me in a second. Because David says, all that is within me, bless his holy name. So he has He's saying, every part of me. Now, there's a similar word from Moses, who wrote some of the Psalms too, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, I believe it's verse 4, where he says, Thou shalt love the Lord with all your might, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. It's the same idea. The Lord your God is one God. And thou shalt love the Lord your God. So there's this idea of everything, like the psalm, all that is in me, all that I am, there's nothing I withhold from him. So here's, let me tell you why corporate worship is dead. If ever corporate worship is dead, and we just, don't we just, someone grab a mic and say, man, the church is dead. We don't go, we get more excited about the, the ball game than we do at church. And you're absolutely right. And it's a very important point. But let me tell you why that is. Because the person saying that, especially me, who says that corporate worship is dead, let me tell you what corporate worship is. You know what it is? You know why we get together? We get together so a bunch of individuals can come together as one and worship God. So if you got a bunch of individuals that are at church and they're going, amazing grace, <laughs> right? Like they're semi-comatose. Let me tell you what's happening in their worship at home when it's just them and God. That's what's going on. The corporate is reflective of the individual. So what we need is individual revival. That's why all the great revivalists, I think it was Wesley said, you want to start a revival? Lord, 
Here's where I want revival to happen. He drew a circle in the dirt around himself. It says, right here in this circle. So suddenly it's not about all them. Oh, man, they're dead. I gotta go there. It's a dead church. Well, maybe you're a dead Christian. Gosh, that was bad. It sounded terrible. Which is actually, not, actually an oxymoron. But maybe, hey, but maybe that like I need to say, hold on a second. Is all that is in me blessing his holy name? And the only thing worthy of summoning all your mind, your soul, your body, your strength is his holy name. Right? His great name. But look at what he says. He says, bless his holy name. Everyone say his holy name. His holy name. What does it mean to bless? Why is his name so important? The name of God is his very identity. So you have in these two verses the most innermost part of who I am and my identity, blessing the and exalting everything and all that he is in his identity as represented by his holy name. If that's not important, what's the opposite of blessing his holy name? What is the opposite of that? Cursing. What does Exodus chapter 20, verse 7 read, which I read this morning? It says, thou shalt not, what? The fourth commandment. Maybe it's the third commandment. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord in vain. And it says this, and we always talk about the commandment with a blessing. Honor your father and mother, you'll be blessed. It's a good one, okay? If you got youngins, that's a real good one, okay? And if you ain't got youngins, you are a youngin, okay? We all have connected, you know, we can honor our parents and honor our spiritual parents. But the one with a curse is it says, he will not hold him guiltless who takes the name of the Lord in vain. And there's a lot to that. Pastor Jay preached through the Ten Commandments. I remember you talked about that verse. Taking his name in vain isn't just cussing like we say, right, Pastor? It's, I mean, you want to, I don't know if you want to shout. I mean, that was really good. Put him on the spot too much. You're tossing this mic. It's a deeper issue. Uh, yeah, I would even go as far. This is kind of risky to say it has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with um, using his, his name for your own selfish advantage. You see a lot of that happening in Christianity or yeah. false Christianity. Um, um, if anyone stands to proclaim God's word uh, with the intent of gaining only riches or wealth, I think anyone who takes advantage of people and their money in the name of God, mm. Mm. Um, there's all kinds of things we could talk about. That's what it actually has to do with yeah. more than anything else. Uh, don't the vocal take, is just a manifestation of what's inside. Sure. Don't. Yeah. And yeah, you can vocally use God's name in an empty and um, sinful way. You can apply it there too, but I think yeah. it has a lot more to do with. Yeah. But his name has a lot more to do with letters on a sheet of paper, right? Or just letters, syllables, and vowels. His name is who he is. It's God Almighty. And David says, look, bless his holy name. His name is holy. What does that mean? That means set apart, separate. That means otherworldly. That means divine. That means stainless and spotless. Exactly right. That's exactly right. There's only salvation. Neither is there salvation in no other name under heaven except for Jesus. So at the name of Jesus, Philippians 2, that great passage, every knee will bow. So there's, there's power in the name of Jesus. There's power in God's name because it, it, it represents who he is, and it's a holy name. So David says our blessing and our praise is God-centered. How much praise music, by the way, worship music, is God theocentric, Christocentric, focused on Him and His attributes and who He is. And I found a bunch of those uh, attributes in this psalm. So we keep going. Bless His holy name. I don't even know what the question number two is. I may have blown past it. Look here. Wow. Okay. What are all His benefits? So look at this next part of the psalm here. This is so rich. Um, just a couple thoughts though on the thing. How often? How wholehearted is our worship? How wholehearted is your personal worship with Jesus? And then how wholehearted is your corporate worship with Jesus? Are we afraid to sing too loud in church because it's going to embarrass everybody? How wholehearted is it? See, or are we half-hearted in that? And David says, all that is within me. 
Just love that concept. Meditate, memorize, meditate on this, guys, even after we're done here. Look. And then he says this, forget not all his benefits. Everybody say forget not. Forget not. How easy do we forget the goodness of God? Am I the only one in here that's forgetful? <laughs> Wait. I can't I remember even. What, what, what are some things we forget? Think about it. Yeah. What, what, are, what are some things with the Lord we forget? He says we forget his power. Yeah, what was it? Yeah, great prophet. Just that little, yeah, wow. I said, well, I was in my bedroom and I just read it for myself, Jeff. <laughs> cool. And so, but he yeah. was so excited. And really to share cool. that, it was like me holding back a lump in my throat awesome. right in the middle of the store, guys. Yeah. It was so amazing. So we forget about, hey, amen, thank you. You know, here's what, here's what kind of, here's what, when he says forget not all his benefits, how often... Do we have miracles in our life happen? I mean, major stuff. I mean, even like our salvation story. And yet we get stuck in a ditch, and we get stuck, and we get sideways, and we have completely forgotten about what, what God has done. Anyone been there? Anyone, anyone testify? Okay. And this was the whole story of Israel. It's like over and over again in the Exodus, in Deuteronomy, in in the Psalms, all over the Old Testament, remember your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Like, it's like a broken record. But they had to be reminded, like, their God, their holy God, the one there to be blessing, extolling, and praising, and worshiping, and having no other gods before him, has just subdued the greatest army on the face of the earth in the Red Sea. He opened up the river, the great Red Sea, and they went through, and he destroyed that army. Wow. He is the God that fought for them. And there he is right there in the cloud, and there he is in the pillar. And yet, if, if they can be forgetful, how forgetful can we be? See? So he says, forget not all his benefits. So the question is, what are his benefits? Oh, wow. Remember yeah. what Christ yeah. really did for us. Yeah. Amen? Now look, to his point, what are things God has done and given us to remember him. So we don't forget. I mean, communion starts off with do this in remembrance. How important is remembrance? If it weren't for remembrance, guess what? The thief on the cross wouldn't be in heaven. What was his salvation prayer? Remember me. Joseph never would have gotten to power in Egypt if the baker hadn't remembered him. Or was it the butcher, the baker, the cupbearer, whichever one didn't? I always mix those guys up. So, um, remembrance is so huge. The whole Bible, by the way, the book of Leviticus, you're like, man, it's just kind of, oh, it's tough to grind through that book. I'm doing the Bible in a year or in a month, like one of my buddies over here is doing. The whole book of Leviticus, all those symbols and all those elements in the temple and in the tabernacle are so we remember. God, I thought it was, I loved uh, Pastor Dwayne put the verse of the day, 822. God put the blood on Aaron's ear, on his right hand, and on his right foot. From head to toe to remember that it's the blood, the covering, and the grace of God. To remember, you have a visible, write it on your doorpost. Put it on the front of your door, right? Deuteronomy 8. As you're going, as you're coming, remember God's words. What did David say in Psalm 63? When I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on you in the night watches. Our whole life, right, everything right now we know from is from our memory. Everything. It could be two minutes ago. It could be 20 years ago. The question is, are we haunted by those memories or are we, are we remembering 
the rich benefits of God. And God says, dwell on what I have done for you. See? Because anything else ain't going to get you anywhere. And the greatest remembrance is what Jesus Christ, which is why we come together and feast on the Lord's Supper, which is why that should be a really big deal. In our churches, to feast on the Lord's Supper, the, 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 the wine, the, the, the grape juice represents his blood shed for us. The bread or the wafer represents his body broken for us. Go into that and remember, this was done for you. Baptism is remembering that, hey, I was buried with him, dead, buried, and raised to life. So it's all a, a holy memory. Paul says to Timothy, stir up a holy remembrance in you. So forget not all his benefits. We're going to talk, what are his benefits? Start show, throwing them out, but Tony, you go first. Uh-oh. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the thief on the cross. Yes, sir. Right. Today. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. 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 So, amen. That's exactly right. So, forget not all his benefits. One way to say remember is to say don't forget. So what are his benefits, guys? So here's the thing. We don't have to jump out of Scripture to find them. Although we can think of a multitudinous number in our lives, thank the Lord. But we're right here. So let's go through them right here. Look at it. Look, look, what's the first one here? I counted 14 of his benefits in this one chapter, 22 verses. You might could count more. And whenever I counted them, I just circle them, okay? So just go through and circle Okay, let's see. What's the first one? I wonder if this one's a big deal. Who forgives all your iniquities? Everyone say forgiveness. Forgiveness. Now, who's writing this? King David, a man after God's own heart. Did David have any iniquities? Yeah. I mean, you know what? Right when I get up and preach a man after God's own heart, somebody in somewhere in that room says, yeah, but what about his adultery and murder and his deceit and all the stuff he did? And he was a terrible dad and, you know, Brutal, didn't even, you know, mind his own house and all kinds of evils happening there. <clears throat> but David here writes, David who penned Psalm 32, Blessed is the man whose transgression is forgiven, to whom the Lord will not hold an account. Who David says in Psalm 51, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. Blot out all my transgressions. Create in me, me a clean, clean heart, heart, O God. Renew the right, right spirit in me. me. David, David wrote, wrote those, and here he says, God's benefits are he forgives all my iniquities. Forgiveness of sin. What other religion, what other belief system, what other paradigm, what other axiom, what other worldview offers total forgiveness and cleansing of sin? Nothing but crickets. Every other religion, you're spending every ounce of your being, all that is in you, you're spending trying to pay for your evil. Whether it's karma in the New Age stuff in Hinduism, you know, whether it's the, 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 the five pillars, and you still don't know. None of the, no one in those religions know where they stand before God. You die today, heaven or hell, are you guilty or innocent? I don't know. Well, you can know if you know God, if you're blessing his holy name, if he has forgiven you all your iniquities. So that's a big one out, right out of the gate. So who forgives? I put this question. What is the scope of the Lord's mercy and forgiveness? How vast is the scope of his mercy? Sean, I'm going to sit down. I want someone else to talk up here and grab that mic if you do. How, how, look, how big is it? How wide is it? How expansive, expansive is his forgiveness? As far as the east, man, he should have put that verse in this psalm. Wait, he did? I didn't quite get that far, did I? Look at look at this. Look at this. Look at verse. Wow. Verse 8. He's merciful, gracious, abounding in mercy. Look at verse 11. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. Look at verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. That's expansive. Why didn't he say north to south, by the way? 
That's a good point. <laughs> the world is flat. Yeah. Okay? The Bible specifically with Yeah, around. Go ahead, Ralph. Real loud. Grab the mic. Okay, sunrise. Okay. That's good. The sun sets in the uh, east and rises in the west, or vice versa. Or it depends on what ocean you're at. Or if you're in New Zealand or California. Okay. That's right. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I love it. You know, it was a very... Very cool. You've seen this maybe this meme on Facebook, and whoever has recently sent it to me, and I'll repost it, where it says God buried our sin, and forgave us our sin, and buried it in the sea of forgetfulness, and he put up a sign that says no fishing. And isn't that cool? Some of y'all have seen that. Hey, guess what? I can't see that enough, right? I don't want to unsee that. That's a really good thing. But as far as the east is from the west, so there's this infinite nature of his forgiveness that's just expansive and what like he said you can go north and come down south but east and west has no limit it just goes on and on and on and so uh so david you, but but to your point jeff the expansiveness of his the mercy of the lord is from everlasting to everlasting david uses all kinds of euph euphemisms and symbols and deep rich examples and illustrations of the depth of god's mercy and the love of God, Ephesians chapter 3, I believe, says, God, you know, is the height, the depth, the width, the breadth. To know God's love, right, is, is my desire. And that's what we have. So he forgives all our iniquities. Colleen, jump in, roll out, hand him that mic. Gracious and slow to anger and mercy. Then you read toward those who hear him. Yeah, that's right. And the most of our problem right now is we do not fear God yeah, very anymore. Good. Yep. We think he's, you know, okay, sitting on it. You know, we, we keep doing it, do yeah. what we do every day, right. you know, and we think he's going to be, I mean, thank God for his forgiveness, but should, we should fear him Absolutely. also. Yeah, and his forgiveness should instill, inspire a fear of God, which we, which, go ahead, right here. Yeah, speak of the mic. God, okay, because what happens is God can forget. We forgive a lot of us. Always seem to remember. Okay, mm -hmm. we have to understand that we are not God, right? we'll get that and we from. have to. When when we forgive somebody that's from. trespassed yeah. against us, it's hard to forget. Okay, so oh, but man. we okay. have to give it to God. That's right. Yeah, and there His you go. forgiveness. Yeah, and, and to his point, God, it doesn't mean God's not omniscient. He knows everything, but he willingly puts away our sin. And, and, but by the way, by the way, where does our sin go? It has to be paid for. You do, the, you do the crime, you do the time. Where does it go? Place called Calvary. So our sin has to be paid for, see? And that, that's the, the beauty that, that, that causes that our heart. To sing his praise. That changes our heart from a heart of stone to a heart of because of Jesus. Go ahead, Bob, jump in there. You had, where, did I uh oh, did I steal your point? Oh no. <laughs> he, he, he's on You'll fire. never steal one of my he, points. He's excited. Because uh -oh. it isn't my point. Amen to that. Amen. God does not I'm not even gonna respectfully say God does not forget anything. He remembers it no more, which means he doesn't of it again. God cannot forget his omniscient. So please don't say that. Violation of sensibility, and that makes God an idiot. No. Okay. Pardon my friend. I got you. Okay, got you. That's okay. All right. Thank you. So, but, but, but okay, but, 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 so what he said is, is what I said that this doesn't violate God's omniscience, but, Right here, he says, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. So we just we, we stick with the language of Scripture. And this is a powerful picture of forgiving our iniquities. And we've only, that's the first benefit. 
We got 14, guys. We're going to get out today at about 2 o'clock. We're going to have lunch at Dario. We're going to have dinner at Dario. Okay? Who for, look, we got to keep moving. Who heals all your diseases? Wow. And by the, by the way, way, all, all the scholars, scholars agree, agree this isn't just talking about physical sickness. This is talking about disease, the fall of man brought in all this disease. Don't blame God on cancer. Don't blame God on nuclear war. Okay? Or don't, don't blame that. Don't blame that on God. It's called the fall of man. It's called the consequences of the curse. But God is a God who heals. There is no disease greater, more powerful than Almighty God. And God can heal and he will heal as he wills. And I am not sovereign to, to impose that on him. But he's given me faith and he's given us and, he, and he's given us the power of prayer. And he is he has healed mightily, and there's testimonies we can be, be here all day. Now we got to keep moving. He heals all your diseases. Look at verse 20, look at verse 4. He redeems your life from destruction. Wow. Where was your life going without Jesus? Destruction is probably a pretty good one-word summary of where I was heading, if not for God. Just read Ephesians chapter 2, the first four or five verses, which I shared with a guy recently, where we were enemies of God. We were sons of the devil. We were, we were sworn against everything against God. But God, verse 5, who is rich in mercy. So we were bit, he redeemed us from destruction. Isn't that wild? And look at this one. He crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercy. That's the whole idea is he just he is just bestowing and pouring his loving kindness and tender mercy. Now let me tell you, Jesus Christ, where does our sin go again? Right? All of this is all of this, one of the, Spurgeon, I think, said that this is the greatest gospel of all the Psalms. This is like the gospel of the Psalms, this Psalm. Because if you think about it, Jesus was crowned with thorns. Why? So we could be crowned with loving kindness and tender mercies. You see that? So this is the great exchange. This is 2 Corinthians 5.21, which we're in 2 Corinthians in two weeks. Next week, Psalm 139. Search me, O God, and know my heart. And then 2 Corinthians 5.21, the whole book of 2 Corinthians, but we'll get to chapter 5, maybe Christmas time or after, where he says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. It's the gospel, Jesus for me, Jesus in my place, so that we could be the righteousness of God in him. So He could he, Christ was clothed with wrath so we could be clothed with righteousness. Made sons of God and daughters of the king. Jim, jump in quick. Grab that mic for that fellow right there. Yes, sir. Yeah. Our father. Oh, wow. Yeah. Man. Love it. Mm. And a whole I've said, and who trust in? Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, so that's very good. And we're we're seeing the imagery of a loving God. We're seeing the imagery of a Lord, His holy name, and we're going to see the imagery of a Father here just in a second. Uh, verse four, uh, more benefits. Look at verse five. He satisfies your mouth with good things. How does God satisfy us? We talked about that. We talked about that in Psalm 42. Like a deer pants for water. There's a thirst. There's a hunger deep in every human being's soul. And only God can fill that hunger. Only God can satisfy. And Jesus said to the Samaritan woman, said, man, look, you're looking for water down here. That ain't going to do anything for you. But the water I give you, it will flow out in abundance. And you'll never thirst again. And so he says, he satisfies my mouth. This is a tangible this is an image of in the wilderness when the children of Israel were hungry, God fed them right out of heaven, manna. God fed them water, white, right out of the rock, fresh water, best water you could drink. And so you have this idea. And look at the second part of this. So that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. What another picture of an eagle and the renewal. Who needs to be renewed? Who needs to be energized? 
You know, who needs to be recalibrated? There's only one way to get renewed, refreshed. One way. It's, yeah, and it's the satisfaction that God provides us. It's found in Him. It's found in His holy name. Go, Pastor Dwayne. Yeah, hand him that mic. Here we go. Yes, sir. I grew up here, and somebody say they couldn't get any satisfaction. Anybody know who sang that song? Oh, yeah, he couldn't get any satisfaction, but saw Proverbs 19.23, the fear of the Lord leads to life, and whoever has it rest in satisfaction. You can have satisfaction in the Lord. I love it. Thank you, brother. That's a good word right there. Wow. Too bad there's not a 19 month and a 23rd day or we'd have that one worked in. But there'll be, we'll, he'll find a way. He'll find a way. <clears throat> so, Proverbs 19.20, I wrote that down. Thank you. So, your youth is renewed like the eagles, this idea of, of an eagle that's soaring, an eagle that's just, you know, it's a picture of, it's a picture of strength. It's a picture of vigor. It's just this picture of energy. And this is what happens from above. You know, you, got, you get depleted, don't you? Anyone else get tired? Burned out, been in the ministry, in your job, and this is how many of us are going to Him with all that is in us to find satisfaction? Yes, sir, go quick. No, no. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah, so in Psalm 4, you know, the same Amen. idea is Isaiah 40, 31, one of my favorite verses with athletes in action. We've quoted it all the time, playing basketball overseas. Even the youths grow weary. It's the strength. It's the dutimus. It's the power of God to salvation. Everyone believes. So quit focusing on your strength and your might. Because it's not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. And connect with him and wait on the Lord. And open your mouth and let him satisfy it. Look to him to fill the deepest need. Quit looking to people. Your wife will not satisfy you. Ultimately, your husband will not. Quit putting that on them. Only Jesus Christ can satisfy you. And when you find your wholeness in him, guess what happens? You have a good marriage. Because suddenly you find out, wait, I'm not here to get from her. I'm here to serve her. Because I am full of God. And there's nothing she can say, do, or act that's going to complete me. Because I'm complete in Jesus Christ. In him I have everything. So he satisfies your mouth. Your youth is renewed like the eagle. He keeps going. Golly, look at all these benefits. That's number seven. The Lord, no, number seven is the Lord executes righteous and justice for all who are oppressed. God Almighty will fight for you. So you think you're oppressed, you're beat up, you think you're in the minority, you are not in the minority. Elijah needs to grab you by the sleeve and take you to the rooftop and look up in heaven and say, God, open his eyes that he'll see the heavenly host that fight for you. The Lord will give righteousness and justice on all who are oppressed. He will fight for you. He will vindicate you. Go, hand him that mic. Not only king of kings, judge over That's judges. Right. That's exactly right. Yeah, so there's a sense of vengeance. God, we saw that last week in Psalm 91. Well, he will not just turn a blind eye. He sees everything, and he will judge. And, and so he says this. He says, <clears throat> He made known his ways to Moses. Wow, just a great, brilliant picture. Moses had this intimacy with God. He spoke to God face to face, and he had the glow of God on him. His acts to the children of Israel. Verse 7 is just an entire, a little verse that takes you into an entire history of God's mighty works on behalf of his people. You know, just one little verse there. Verse 8, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in mercy. So he's slow to anger. He's patient with us. He's abounding in mercy. He will not always strive, nor will he keep his anger forever. There's coming a day where God's wrath will be unleashed. Romans 1.18, the wrath of God is revealed against all unrighteousness. That's why we're still here, by the way. Jesus Christ was the object of wrath for us. He bore God's wrath for us on that tree on Calvary to give us a new life so we could warn everyone else about the wrath of God to come. This, is, this will change your witnessing. You need to get off this. I mean, keep telling people God loves them, but you really need to say, hey, buddy, 
I don't care how flippant you are or how casual you are, you're just rolling along, but you will be judged in God. Are you prepared for God's wrath? They're going to call you hellfire and brimstone. You can do it in a gracious way, by the way, and you're not smacking them in the head with your King James Bible. But your words will haunt them for eternity if they don't turn to Christ. Because they're going to be in that brimstone, and they're going to remember what you said. And you're thinking, they think I'm an idiot, and everyone else is looking at me. But what you're doing is you're saving their life. And if they come to Christ, they'll spend the rest of their life praising God for that numbskull guy that shared the gospel with them. Amen? So it's God's love, it's God's wrath, it's real. And you will not hold it forever. Go. Yeah, but we can't just show up to people and say, you know, God's wrath. We need to be, have an authority to speak and with people Absolutely. about Jesus yeah. and how we do that by loving on them. That's right. And right. build bridges yeah. so we can talk yeah. truth to them. Absolutely. The problem today in the society, 50% of Americans right now, they curse us. Hey, these Christian people, there's a lot of people, yeah. really, they don't understand the truth, that yeah. we're the light. Yeah. We're the yeah. ones yeah. who man up, you know, the, the, the homeless shelter and yeah. the, the prison ministry and all right. these places, but somehow not impacting our neighborhood. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes. Evil one is a liar, yeah. and he lies about us. But truly, we're not shining the light, and yeah. we're not living this life. You know yeah. that the forgiveness and right. being the the the, the priests yeah. and the kings Absolutely. are supposed to be. Yeah. So so look, look here's the, here's the deal. That's an absolute given. The fruit of the spirit is love. Okay. But how many buddies and friends did Jesus Christ make? Okay. And and, and his unlimited friends executed him naked, bleeding on a cross. So he didn't come to make friends. He came to save us. We don't need a friend. We don't need a pal. We need a savior. Okay? So 100% right, the way he sends us out is in love. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, we, we, we need to proclaim boldly and graciously. But here's what, what will happen, Colleen. We will still be hated because Jesus said it. He said, blessed, blessed are you when men hate you and love you for my name's sake. The key is, am I hated because of Jesus, or am I hated because I'm just a rude, you know, loud mouth, you know, Bible-thumbing Christian who doesn't really care about the people. I'm just doing drive-by, you know, evangelism yelling at them. See? That's right. So is, is, is Jesus, is, am I making him the issue? And so all those, to, definitely to your point, go. I'm talking to that mic right there. John chapter 3, the fastings, you know, John 3, 16, everybody memorized it, but you go down to 36, and you don't accept Jesus, and the wrath of God remains on you. It is hellfire and damnation, people, and America doesn't know it. Yeah. 50 years of love, 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 but no, no judgment. Out of its love comes his justice. Out of its justice comes his judgment. And the bottom line is there are only two destinations, heaven and hell. And if you don't love them enough to tell them where they're going so that they can go to the other place, hey, that's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's right. That's a good, good point, yeah. But, did you, yeah, go ahead. We got to join real quick. And then we got to keep moving, guys. Jesus, we want the world to love our Jesus, and that they're not going to love Him. Hmm. See, so our, our job is actually just to share the gospel in love, in truth, right. but to share the gospel. And the thing is, many ain't going to accept it. Right. And that you know, and and if we're looking for everyone to love our Jesus, you know what's going to happen? That's going to make us discouraged. That's going to discourage right. us. So we just got to stand on the word, the foundation right. of the word, and share right. this gospel. Right no matter what. And with all that, to everyone's point, we should ask God to the, the things that break his heart break our heart. So, so rather than get angry and want to put our fist through the TV, we should have... T When's the last time you cried for a lost person? When's the last time you saw a lost person and you literally saw... One of my disciples in college said, Stu, I want you to go witness to someone. We were witnessing in Hollywood to the craziest people you'd ever seen. 
He said, I want you to, next time you witness to someone, because I was all about apologetics, proving God's existence, you know, showing how smart I am. I've been going to Bible college and all that. He said, next time you witness to an unbeliever, I want you to see the flames of hell coming off of them. And you ask God to break your heart, like Sammy Tippett in Romania. He landed in Romania. He was kind of frustrated. He had a bad flight. He just didn't feel it. And he was there to reach these communists for Christ. He didn't feel it. He said, God, I'm going to sit in that chair right there, and I'm going to have my Bible open, and I just pray you will break my heart for these people. I would pray. And he just sat there and prayed and prayed and prayed. And about two hours into it, tears started flooding down his face. That will change how you share the gospel. See? That's the kind of love, you know. Yeah. So that's exactly right. So, so he said, look, he, but, look, but here's the thing. As soon as we start thinking about those bad sinners out there and how much they need the Lord and we do need to reach them, we must be reminded that, verse, verse 10, he has not dealt with us according to our sins. Hey, what if God dealt with you according to your sins? What would you be? Hey, God, don't pray this. Hey, God, give me what I deserve. See? You want what you deserve? You really want that? So he has not dealt with us according to our sins nor punished us according to our iniquities. See? And then he takes us to the heavenlies. As the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, we talked about this a little bit ago, he's removed our transgressions from us. Here's the father analogy someone brought up, I think, Jim. As the father pities his children, so the Lord pities, has mercy, has compassion upon those who fear him. Beautiful. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. We forget that, you know, but he remembers we're dust, guys. This may be your last time at Wednesday in the Word. I don't know. So how intentional. Who am I going to take to heaven with me if this is my last day? Because that's what matters. Yeah, I want to know how college is going. Any girlfriends? How's it, what's your major? Yeah. Oh, what a third cousin that went to that school. Great college, yeah. They still have that burger joint on the corner, yeah. How about this? Talk about that stuff to warm up, to show you care. But get to write this. How's your relationship with Jesus? Because this will probably be our last conversation. Because those two people are never going to get married again. Hopefully not. And all these people aren't going to come from 20 different states to this wedding. So this will be the last time I talk to you. So rather than talking about what we do, like this diet drink or that diet drink or how's the kids and blah, 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 talk about that. Ask people about their soul because that's what matters. He knows our frames. He remembers that we are just dust. We're dust in the wind. This day is gone. James chapter 4, life is but a vapor, right? So there's a frailty. So he knows our frame. And by the way, who else knows our frame? Jesus. Hebrews chapter 4, remember that? He was tempted at all points, just like we are, yet without sin. We have a high priest who understands the pressure, who lived, who was tempted. See, so he, he walked, he took on flesh and bones, amen? The word became flesh. So we have Jesus Christ. So, so we got we to wrap it up. <clears throat> Pastor Jay, get queued up. Yeah, go quick, go quick. Yeah. So here you go, yeah, go quick. Here. Right here. Big B. You got to hear it. What you were saying about the ministries, yes. and because I teach love every day of the week. Amen. Seven days a week, I teach love. Teach love. Ooh, y'all feel that? Yeah. <laughs> I'm about to become an ordained minister, Stu. All right. I came to tell you that. That's why I made sure I made it. I was late. Praise the Lord. Come on. Ordained minister. I'm working every day. Oh. Ministries. I'm in the trenches. You, you heard him say, you get so mad, you want to punch through. Look at that. Because you get so mad. Oh, like wow. an astronaut going out of space. Pressure you. To tell people about your Lord and Savior, right? Mm -hmm. And I do it every day. I, my, the people I reach are a little younger mm -hmm. and they're a little further out. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. Because oh, yeah. at a certain age, we get our stuff together. I'm 38 turning 39 next month. At a, at a certain age, we tidy up. We stop playing. We put a great childish game. Some of us later than others. Put down the alcohol. The smoke, the doobies, right? Put all that stuff away. And we say, I'm committed to my Lord and Savior every day. Every day, just like my grandmother was. Didn't take a day off. She lived to 90-something. We didn't even put her on WXI because she didn't want to. We're just like, nah. And you're an answer to her prayer. Definitely. Every day. She prayed for me every day. Right there. 
Praise God. I was adopted. There's I, a six foot eight inch nine, man of God six, right nine, there. Six nine. Three quarter inches. Come on, Stu. It used to be like 400 pounds. I don't know. Man, man, I've been eating clean. You're dunking again. I know you are. You, you know it. I'm scared about that. Come on. We will go to the court later. I got my ball and my shoes in the car. Ready. All right. Awesome. Praise God. You, used to, you got a good J still. You're not, you didn't give up the jumper yet. I'm getting old. Last year, last year I was 340 pounds. I'm 235. 10 months. Unbelievable. Two Almost two gallons of water a day where I got to I gotta keep like a baseball player. I got one foot in the bathroom all day. Praise God. Juice, coffee, fresh pressed juice, coffee, smoothies. Rabbit, rabbit food at night, no meat, carrots, but oh. celery, lettuce, spinach. Whew. That's it. Praise Let God. the body do the rest. Amen. Awesome. Hey, what a blessing. Hey, thank you. Hey, guys. Yes, sir. We're almost thank done. You, I don't know if we can get all these verses, but how about my, let's just thank God for my brother here. Um, Big B. Hey, oh, I want a bunch of guys to pray for him. When we're done, we're going to get our hands around and pray for him. Amen. Pastor, Pastor Jay's about to about sing. I want everybody to stand up. Look at these final verses. I tried to do every verse in here. As for man, his days are like grass, as the flower of the field he flourishes, and the wind passes over, it's gone, and its place remembers it no more. But the mercy of the Lord, everyone say the mercy of the Lord, is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children. This is generational blessing. You fear God. Your wife fears God. You instill the fear of the Lord, the love of Jesus into your children, and then into your grandchildren, and children's children, and the blessing goes on. What kind of seed am I raising? How am I pouring? The greatest discipleship ministry opportunity is right there under your own roof. And people that are in your own relatives, get right and reconciled and pour into your family, your children's children. Verse 17 is a great promise. To such as keep his covenant. To those who remember his commandments to do them. Verse 19, the Lord has established his throne in heaven. His kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, you his angels, who excel in strength to do his word, heeding the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, you his host, you ministers of his who do his pleasure. Bless the Lord, all his works, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. David starts with an individual, him crying into his soul to look up with all that is in him. And then he takes us all the way to this universal, the heavenly host, and every being to bless the Lord. And then he closes with the same note. And so I put these final questions here. We're done. Um, how passionate am I about blessing the Lord? I'm going to challenge every one of you to get alone with God and bless him and bless his holy name with all that is in you. Put a praise song on. Praise his name. Look at the attributes of God. Bless his name. How has he blessed me? Spend some time giving thanks every day. It's crazy. I watched a secular motivational speaker. Doesn't even know Jesus. You know what he said? Every day, make a gratitude list. It'll change your life. I'm just thinking, if a, if a pagan does that, how can we forget not all his benefits, right? And then final question. I love this. Who am I sharing this good news with? Who am I sharing? Hey, an evangelist, a pastor in England was brokenhearted for a criminal who was being paraded through town, taken to the gallows to hang from the neck for his crimes. The reverend jumped down, walked to the street, and pleaded with this young man to repent and follow Jesus. And he started telling this young man, about the grace of God and how God sent his son to die for him. And you know what the man looked at him? The man didn't repent, but the man looked at this, this reverend. He said, Reverend, if what you're saying is true, he said, I would crawl all over England on my knees on glass to spread that message. And can we not just tell someone that we've been sitting in the next cubicle, to, you know, or someone that we work with or somewhere where we get gas or every? can we not just tell people? So Pastor Jay is going to sing. We're all going to sing with him as able. But I'm going to tell you what he's going to sing is a song written by a guy. Check this out. Age seven years old, his dad committed suicide. He didn't find out about it until he was 10. His mom married another man who was very abusive. And this young man had a rough, difficult, abusive childhood. And he found Jesus Christ. He wandered into a camp meeting. He heard the gospel. He got saved. He became an amazing artist, and he wrote a song called 10,000 Reasons, and his name is Matt Redman, and the song he wrote was inspired by looking and reading and praying Psalm 103 and allowing God to come in to all the sin and the pain in his life, and that's what we're going to close with right now. Pastor Jay.
Lord, I worship your holy name. And he uh, drove all the way from Mooresville to a special school here, and I would take him up and down the highway uh, every day, every morning, every afternoon, and we would play this song 20 times, and he <laughs> could sing it, and he would sing it from the bottom of his heart, and that's the way we're to sing it. And so let's pray. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, how majestic is your name. Oh, Lord, we bless, bless your name. You. We lift your name on high. You are the King of kings, Jesus. You are the Lord of lords, Jesus. You are the only Savior, the only name by which we can be saved. No other name, only one lifeline from heaven. Father, we proclaim your name to the ends of the earth. And we go west and we go east and we go north and we go south. We go in all directions now. And, 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 and you know all our sins. You are omniscient. <laughs> but by the blood of Jesus, you wash our sins clean. They are eradicated. And they are no more in your sight. Because you are holy and, and our sins cannot be in your presence. But the imputed righteousness of Christ has washed us clean. And we are holy in the sight of God by the blood of Jesus, and we give you all the praise and honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's children said, Amen. Hallelujah. Everyone say, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Awesome. Pray with one person before you leave, and the boxers need to get some hands on this guy and pray for him real quick. Thank you.